We've got a jet flying over, so hopefully that won't be too much of a disruption. Clear skies. They shouldn't be flying in the DIA today. Um, so I thought I'd talk about one of the... <clears throat> I was introduced to this framework uh, just as I was starting my career uh, right out of college. And the story goes like this. I love telling this story. Um, I was uh, going to design reviews and um, what I call it, reading code and that kind of stuff as a young engineer out of college, software engineer. And people were not particularly happy with me. And the uh, director, a gentleman by the name of Bob Berryman, who I still have lunch with today, uh, called me into his office, which is a big deal to have a director call you into his office. And he said, uh, you know, you're a bright young man, but you're ticking everybody off. And he said, I think you need to go to a conflict resolution class. And so I, <clears throat> you know, I wasn't going to tell a director no what the, as a new kid out of school. So I went to this class. And I was introduced to a woman by the name of Eliza uh, Eilers and Nancy Barger. And they were teaching conflict resolution, which actually was couched or in the context in which they taught it was MBTI or Myers-Briggs uh, instrument. Uh, it's Myers-Briggs is a Jungian instrument, uh, Jungian psychology, which uh, if you recall any psychology, Jung was a disciple of Freud. Actually, they had a bit of a falling out. And as I recall, it was a falling out over a woman. But anyway, they, uh, uh, Jung had a theory. He had written a paper called Psychological Types. And uh, Isabel Myers and Catherine Briggs, uh, mother-daughter team, collaborated on taking that psychological paper, this archetype theory, and translating it into a framework that people could actually use. And that's what I was introduced to as a young man. And uh, it, was a, it was an eye-opener. If you've ever had a chance, or if you do get a chance, to go to a large group that is doing Myers-Briggs <clears throat> training, um, do so. Because what they do is they set up a, a set of exercises that actually allows you to see uh, Myers-Briggs in action. And that's where the, the, the really uh, fact that people think differently, that people are different, that they make decisions differently, uh, that they perceive the world differently comes to light in, in some very, very impactful and meaningful ways. <clears throat> and that's what happened to me. I'll never forget when uh, introduced to one of the um, uh, aspects of Myers-Briggs and listening to this other group talk with such emotion and uh, frankly, frankly uh, vehemence at the group I was in on how we make decisions and realizing how much conflict there was in the world just not understanding each other. And so that started this 30-year journey of uh, doing MBTI. I've used it extensively as a manager in trying to understand and how to approach people better. I've used it <clears throat> in team building activities where the team gets very clear about what are its rules of engagement, if you will. How are we going to work together and how are we going to leverage this? Because ultimately, Isabel Myers <clears throat> wrote a book called Gifts Differing. And their, their intent was not to type people not to get people to be put into a box, which a lot of people who have been introduced to MBTI in the past have uh, taken away from it. It was actually to help people recognize the strengths of people coming from different differences and coming together and making for a stronger team ultimately. <clears throat> and I've seen that. I've seen that over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, it was ironic. I was thinking about this topic about a week ago, and yesterday I was having a chat uh, with a gentleman one of our clients, uh, a leadership co coaching client, who had uh, taken the assessment, we were, t we were struggling with why he wasn't comfortable with making decisions. Why did it look like he was a little bit, <clears throat> we, we, uh, I suggested he do the MBTI, and he took it, <clears throat> and uh, through that process of reviewing the, the, uh, this framework, he had, he had an epiphany, he realized that he was making decisions in one particular way, uh, which we'll describe here as I give you the framework in a moment, but that that way of doing it was contrary to how he ex thought he was expected to make decisions. And so there was a dissonance here. So he knew on this side, this is the right decision for him, for the information that he had, but he was expecting this. He's not good at this. And so there's a clash. There's an issue and a challenge. And in that clash, we get, I don't know, I'm not sure. 
So recognizing that, he can now work with that. He can now realize that this is a strength, this is what he brings to the organization, and he can learn how to integrate that with what's expected and how to deliver that to people who behave this way. And what do you call it, come to a, a stronger, wholer decision that was clear for this group of people who needed clarity and was consistent with his own sense of, of correctness, if you will, or fairness in the decision making. So it's a very, very powerful instrument. It is a framework. <clears throat> it's like any other framework. There are uh, challenges with the framework. Sometimes it works in some cases and not in others. And in fact, one of the things that Myers-Briggs, it's been around for decades, um, has a challenge with is a lot of people have misrepresented it and uh, in, the, in the way of saying that, well, if you take the assessment, it's going to tell you that you're this way, you're an introvert. And therefore, <clears throat> you now have an excuse to behave like an introvert all the time. And that is actually uh, quite false. The idea is that I understand how I behave, what I need, and I can ask for and I can collaborate with others, extroverts in this particular case, um, to, to create something better. So I thought I'd introduce the framework to you. I am a uh, certified Myers-Briggs uh, practitioner. So, um, and I would suggest that if you go to the web, you'll see all sorts of MBTI tests. Um, get one <clears throat> that's taken uh, from somebody who's a, a certified practitioner. You're getting the actually validated, very, very highly scientifically validated instrument as well as a better interpretation. Because the other thing is um, we do not, the, the assessment does not tell you what your type is. The assessment informs you and your own decision making given the framework as to what your type is, how you, how you fit into the world or how you perceive the world. So actually what we're going to do here <clears throat> is you can play along. I'm going to tell you the instrument. I'm going to tell you the framework basically. And as we go along, you're going to be able to self-type yourself and walk away going, eh, I'm that, I, I think I'm an ISTJ, which is who you're talking to today. I'm an ISTJ. Um, those letters will mean something uh, uh, when we're done here. And then um, you can go and do some research and see whether that actually fits for you or not. And if it doesn't fit for you, perhaps you'll um, take an MBTI test or do some further reading. There's all sorts of interesting books out there. Uh, the two that I most highly recommend are Gifts Differing by Isabel Myers, and the other one is uh, Was That Really Me? by a woman by the name of Naomi, N-A-O-M-I, Quink, Q-U-E-N-K. So a couple of really, really good resources for this. All right, <clears throat> so let's talk about this. So what in the psychological type paper that MBTI was sourced from, uh, Jung postulated that normal human beings, so we're talking about normal psychology, not abnormal psychology, that normal human beings have to have a yin and a yang and a balance to everything. And that uh, that balance needs to be uh, understood. And over time, you need to be able to understand that there are two sides to something. And if and actually midlife crisis is when you wake up one day and realize that I've spent my whole life doing this and none of this and I got this, this little challenge associated with it. So he basically said that in order for normal people to behave in the world, you have to be able to perceive the world. So you have to be able to understand what it is that's going on around you. You know, what do you see? What do you not see? That kind of stuff, right? And then you need to make a judgment. You need to be able to actually act to make a decision. So an abnormal psychology perspective is that one, a person who simply perceives the world, just simply looks at information, gathers information, takes information in, uh, sorts information, all that kind of stuff, but doesn't ever make a decision, is, is abnormal. That's the person I uh, lovingly call the 40-year-old who's living in your basement. Uh, this is a person that maybe is, is uh, really good at all sorts of uh, telling stories and, and relating things, and they have all this information, but they can't seem to make a decision about their life. Um, so Jung says in order to be normal, there's got to be a balance. There's got to be perceiving and judging. Someone who does judging only without any kind of data, right, that kind of person is going to come across as being a little uh, crazy, right? Uh, probably some stronger words than that for some people uh, because they're, they're making decisions and there doesn't seem to be any basis. There doesn't seem to be any data. There doesn't seem to be any reason by which they came to that particular decision or conclusion. And so this is about a balance of those two, perceiving the world, how do we see it, and making judgments in, in the world. Now, 
<clears throat> within the perceiving space, whoops, wrong hand, <laughs> within the perceiving space, Jung postulated there were two ways that people perceive the world. One are people who are very fact-oriented. These are what he called sensors. These are people who are very interested in what is real, what is actual, what is now. These people like grounded data. These people like, um, they, they like the present reality. They like to know that uh, there's sol solidity around what it is we're discussing and what is the information necessary to make the decision that we're ultimately going to make over here. So these people are, are um, if you were to draw it, uh, they would take information and they'd go one, two, three, four, five. They would sort the information out. Uh, one of my favorite stories is I was uh, working at Avaya and I was at a conference and the speaker wasn't talking very loudly. And I happen to be a sensor. I'm a very strong sensor. And uh, what do you call it? There were a bunch of Mardi Gras bees. We were in New Orleans and they were on the table. And I was a little bored by the lecture. <clears throat> and so I started sorting the beads. And it was pretty easy to sort the beads initially by color. And it was like, oh, that's fascinating, right? And then it was like, oh, I didn't realize it, but there's different sizes of the beads, uh, or the, the, you know, the rings that the beads are on, the necklaces. And so I sorted them by size. And then I realized that the actually the actual little beads on them were different shapes. Some of them were cubes and triangles and and uh, round circles and I sorted them that way and about that time the vice president I was working for grabbed the pile and said stop it I can't handle it anymore right I'm doing that sensing thing I'm just kind of making sense out of the real world data that was going on on the table so that's what a sensor is like now on the other side of sensing so we got sensing on this side on the other side is someone who is intuitive these people are more into the big picture Reality, it's not like that they're, they don't live in reality. We all live in reality. But they're more interested in what's possible. What does all this interlinkage look like? What's, what's the, uh, the, what are the other patterns that are in here? What's the meaning underneath the pattern itself? So a sensor loves patterns, right? A sensor can go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but they're not really looking for any kind of meaning underneath that necessarily. Whereas an intuitive is going, geez, I wonder if that is a new way to think about counting, right? Or something of that nature. So these people are very, very big picture. A great example of an intuitive <clears throat> is for those who've seen the movie uh, A Beautiful Mind. There's a scene in there where the uh, main character steps into this, what turns out to be a uh, this is probably a poor example because it's a psychological misbehavior on his part, but he steps into a large room and there's a huge panel up there on the wall and all sorts of numbers. And he looks at the wall and numbers start leaping out to him and start pairing up and so forth. That's how an intuitive thinks. A sensor would be going, so can I get these in an order? Is there any kind of clarity around how they're structured or something like that? Whereas an intuitive is seeing linkages between things that a sensor may not see. So those are the two differences, sensors and intuitives. And you can see how conflict can happen as a result of that, right? Somebody who's going, well, we got to know, we got to know, right, is probably talking from a sensing perspective. And intuitive has moved on and going, yeah, we got enough, we got enough, we got enough, right? And so there becomes this tension between the two going, we got to spend more time, what do you call it, moving on about, you know, testing some hypothesis and so forth. And this group going, well, we don't know enough. Let's go get some more data. Let's go get some more information. All right. So that's a perceiving function. So you're either a sensor, <laughs> this thing, the sensing thing is driving me nuts because this thing is backwards for me. You're either a sensor, someone who's data oriented, or you're intuitive. Take a pick. Which one resonates with you the most? Okay. So you're either S, excuse me, S, sensing, or N, intuitive. Right. All right. <clears throat> the second internal process has to do with making the decisions. So we've taken care of proceeding, and now we're going to move to making decisions. And what Jung said was that he believes that people make decisions based on two different what's called dichotomies. One are people who are very logical and analytical. They actually t think of things very objectively. Fairness for them is they basically look at the information from the perceiving function, whether it was coming from sensing or intuition, and they basically say, logically, analytically, does this make sense? And if I can come up with the same answer every time, then I have either, I have perceived the world correctly such that I've made the right decision. I've made the fair decision. Um, the great analogy for this, <clears throat> this is going to date myself a little bit, but the original Star Trek, uh, or even the new Star Trek, 
uh, in the movies, Spock is the ultimate thinker. It's very analytical and logical. Uh, it's not like, and even in the character Spock, he has emotions underneath. It's not like they don't feel. It's not like they don't um, get sad, happy, or whatever, right? So they're not quite totally emotionless like Spock pretends to be. But they're very analytical in that decision making. So I'm a thinker. Um, I've unfortunately had the, a career where I had to lay off people and I would struggle mightily to come up with an algorithm <clears throat> that would allow me to make what I thought was a fair decision, which meant that when I looked at all the information, I consistently came down to these are the folks that we're unfortunately going to be asking it to leave the organization. So I felt terrible about it. God, I tell you, I, that's what drove me into consulting. But ultimately, it came down to that analytical decision. Now, you pair that up with the other dichotomy, and that's this group of people. <laughs> God, this camera is driving this sensor up a wall. It's an intuitive group or a thinking group of people, feelings. Feeling is the other side. Now, this does not mean that they make decisions based upon emotions. It means that they're making decisions based upon a value system, right? They're guided by their own sense of what is right or wrong, inherently on how they see the situation or the context. So they're very much based upon, uh, as a result, how it's gonna impact people, how is it going to uh, create a, a dissonance or, or a lack of harmony within the team. Uh, so they're looking at the, the human system aspect of the decision. So one way to, to actually uh, put these two up against each other is a thinker. If I have a group, if I have a decision in here, a thinker would actually remove themselves from this, look at it analytically and go, oh, okay, analytically, this is what we need to do and make that decision. A feeler actually puts themselves into the situation, looks around and says, oh, so based upon the decisions we're about to make, it's gonna have these kind of influences on this human system, harmony, value systems and so I would make a different decision and that actually was the epiphany I had back in that, that story I was relating where I started with MBTI where I, I learned that uh, people thought differently I was the analytical guy and so I never thought that telling somebody that their code was wrong or that the design was not going to work was coming across and um, hurting the harmony in the system and it's not that I wasn't right or wrong and it wasn't that they were right or wrong. It was the fact that I didn't appreciate how it was being received. And so I discovered different ways to be my analytical self, but do that in a way that created uh, a harmony, the best kind of harmony we could have with feelers in the room. So it's a very, very powerful, a lot, a lot, a lot of conflict happens between thinking and feeling uh, within teams and organizations. So bottom line. Are you a thinker or are you a feeler? Feelers, value systems, thinkers, analytical and logical. All right, now <clears throat> there are two more dichotomies. Each one of these are dichotomies because they're, they're, they're yin and yang to each other. Uh, is introvert and extrovert? And this is one that most people know about. Uh, although a lot of people have a different idea of how to actually assess whether they're, they're an introvert or whether somebody is an introvert or not. Most people look at the behaviors. So people very clearly say introverts are very quiet and reserved and extroverts are very in there and out there and making decisions and, and engaging people. And in fact, those are typically the behaviors, but that's actually not the best way to tell whether somebody's an introvert or an extrovert. You have to ask the person, is the person feeling an energy drain or is the person getting an energy boost? Um, introverts typically need that introspection, that quiet time in order to gain energy, in order to engage. As opposed to extroverts, when they go internal, they actually lose energy, so they don't feel as good. They need the interaction of others in order to boost their energy up. So it's about an energy draw, it's not about behaviors. I'm an introvert, I'm a pretty darn strong introvert. I would much rather, at this point in time, even though I'm only talking to myself on a computer, but recognizing I'm talking to a whole bunch of other people, this is draining for me. This is really tough for me to do. I'd rather be out there in that lawn mowing it quietly in my head, thinking about what are the next things I'm going to do for the day. But I know 
that I need to be extroverted behaviors and I recognize that it's taking an energy drain for me and so I will take care of myself. Now this one is interesting when it comes to teams as well because it really creates a lot of attention. Um, this is one that I totally misread when I first uh, applied uh, using the framework to help do some team building with a team that I, I dearly love. Um, what do call it? The, we had one extrovert on the team and a whole bunch of introverts. Uh, Bob Bar Hartman always talks about the joke about you can always tell an introverted engineer versus an extroverted engineer because the extroverted engineer looks at your shoes. Uh, we, we predominantly work in an environment that is made up of introverts. So it's rare to have an extrovert, a true extrovert, on a team. <clears throat> so they're usually uh, a minor group that are extroverts and a lot of people who are introverts. And you put that group together and some very interesting things happen from a um, teaming perspective. The extrovert goes, hey guys, we need to go do this. And the extrovert gets energy by interacting. So they want to talk about it now. They want to act about it now. And the introverts sit there and they need to do an internal. They need to reflect. They need to go off and then come back to that. And so what happens in the meeting is, hey guys, we should talk about this. Silence. Absolute silence. And this guy goes, but come on, let's go, let's go. Silence. You push them. Introverts now are feeling a bigger energy drain. Now you're asking me to jump out there, right? Yeah. We got a little bit of a problem. Extrovert walks away going, those other guys, those guys over here, they're not, they don't care. They are, they're not interested in teaming. They won't engage. And so we, we wind up with a misunderstanding between each other. That's, that's one way of doing it. Uh, the other side is we're not, you know, introverts need to recognize that these extroverts need to talk. And so at least say, hey, can you give us a minute, <laughs> right? And then we'll engage. And please do engage so that you can actually start to, to collaborate together. So that's another dichotomy. So decide. Do you get energy by kind of going in on yourself and thinking? Um, or are you the kind of person who really needs to get out there and immediately engage with people and you get energy from that? Introvert, extrovert, right? All right, there's one last dichotomy we need to talk about. <clears throat> this comes down to uh, something that's very interesting about the instrument, the framework, uh, and that has to do with judging versus perceiving. So if you recall, I said that Jung said that people have to be able to perceive the world, sensing versus intuition, and then they have to make judgments, thinking versus feeling. And this last dichotomy actually is saying, which one of these two do you have tend to have a preference for? And, it, and it's spelled out, it, so they literally call it judging versus perceiving. So a judging uh, temperament, someone who has a, 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 a tendency to judge, right? They like closure. They like a plan. They like things to follow the plan. They like to know they hit the plan, that it, that it finished on the timeline that it was expected to finish. Whereas the perceiving people are going, yeah, plans are fine, but... Things happen, things emerge. I want to enjoy the journey, right? These people, when they go on vacation, these people being judging, will tend to have a, an itinerary. And when the itinerary winds up with some kind of a challenge, you know, a late flight, a, a flat tire on the, on the rental car, something that disrupts the plan, there's a tremendous amount of energy and angst associated with that because it's challenging the ability to get the plan done. Whereas the, the people who are more perceiving are going, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what new adventures that might bring or what stories I can bring back as a result of having a flat tire out in the middle of the wilderness someplace. Right? So they're very different about how they approach being able to actually take in what's going on versus wanting to drive for closure. So if you're judging, you tend to be the person who likes closure, you like a plan. And if you're perceiving, you like the experience. It's not that either one is better or worse about getting something done. They simply approach the work in a different way. So decide for yourself, are you more judging or are you more perceiving? And the combination of those four levers winds up being your type. And I would suggest that you can take that type. So I said I'm an ISTJ, which means I'm introverted, I'm sensing, I tend to make decisions based upon analytics, so I'm thinking, and I'm judgmental. Right? I make judgments. I like plans. I like closure. Type in ISTJ on, uh, on, the, uh, on Google and look for uh, a description. Most of the descriptions are pretty accurate and see whether that resonates with you. 
if one of these dichotomies say you're not sure I'm I think there's parts of me that are feeling and parts of me that are actually thinking that's very 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 well could be the case read the opposite so in my case I read an ISFJ as opposed to an ISTJ and just see which one resonates better with me and then one of the best litmus tests is actually to go talk to a spouse or someone who knows you really well and have them tell you so what's all this got to do with agile <laughs> well Agile are and how we like to approach the world can really get into some of the conflicts that I'm talking about. The richness of MBTI goes beyond this simple description of introvert versus extrovert, sensing versus intuition, and gets into some combinations of things, right? So a sensing judicious person, someone like myself, is data-oriented and planful, which ultimately means I want to know how we're going to get something done. That's what's most important to me. How are we going to get something done? What are the steps? The sensing steps and closure, right? So if I'm a sensor, it's SJ on a team, and I'm in the team with a whole bunch of intuitive thinkers, right? So intuitive people are about big picture. They're about making an analytical decision around that, but, but being open to other possibilities in the big picture. Um, these people are very much about competency, they're going to be really kind of ticked at me wanting to constantly come down to a plan and commit to it and deliver on it. They want to allow for uh, the ability to think about something bigger, something different, something else might come out. Uh, and so we'll have conflict. So what we want to do with a team is show them this framework, have people individually kind of figure out who they are, and then to talk about how are we going to create some some uh, what I call it, rules of the road, some, some aspects to our team alliance about approaching each other when it comes to certain situations. An example of this <clears throat> is one around decision making. Uh, this one is my favorite. It's one that I always bring to a team. I sometimes even do it in my Agile for Teams class if I get a sense that, that we've got a, a wide variety of uh, dichotomies in the room. And it has to do with the fact that decisions often don't stick. Um, commitments, a sprint commitment doesn't stick, or a or an idea of what the tasks are necessary to get a particular project or um, story done. And what we, so what we do is we're wanting to leverage the strengths. Going back to Isabel Meyer's gifts differing perspective, we want to bring all of this together to create a really strong whole. So what we what we do <clears throat> is called a Z process. So we start with sensing. I never can tell which way I'm going on this thing. We start with sensing, what's known? And the intuitive people in the room, they sit here and they go, we need to go through that process for these people, so I'm going to forgive, I'm going to give time for the sensors to get what they need. What is really known? What is the data? What's real? What's grounded information? And the sensors know that ultimately we've got to make a decision, so we've made an agreement that we're only going to do this up until some point in time, possible things that we may want to take out of that. And then we're going to move down to, so I'm trying to make a Z here and I'm not doing a very good job. Now we're going to move down, down here to, so what's the analytical choice? Based upon all those possibilities, based upon the data that we have, what are, what's the most analytical, logical choice that we would actually do? And then we're going to check in and see if we made that choice, what would it mean to the people we're working with? to the people we're delivering the software to, to the harmony and the value system that we've all agreed that we stand and stood up for. So if you do that, you're honoring all four types of decision-making that are in the human beings. You get a richer set of decisions as a result, and you get a very tightly linked team around that decision. So it's one way, one of many, many ways that you can use Myers-Briggs. There's all sorts of other um, interesting information about the Myers-Briggs. There's temperaments, uh, which has to do with how people uh, want to see the world and work with the world. <clears throat> there is stress. Um, you know, um, when, when certain types are put under certain stress, stressors, they have a particular kind of response. Uh, I'll give you a quick example of that. I'm an ISTJ. When I get under stress, I get really sensing. I start trying to collect every teeny piece of information that I can possibly collect in order to make sure I got a got it uh, understood well and so I'll over sense and that can be really kind of a challenging if I was on a team with you and we were under stress um, and then I can ultimately get pushed into what's called the grip 
where I'm now so wound up around this that I actually flip. I go from being a really good sensor and one who's just collecting all sorts of information to one who's now intuiting but doing it very poorly. And so I'm thinking about all the bad things that could possibly happen to us and the team and what we're doing and so forth. So there's a really, really big richness to this MBTI. Um, I'm hoping that by just introducing it here, I've intrigued you. If you'd like to have a MBTI assessment done, we're certainly willing to do that. Uh, simply drop us an email and I'd be glad to connect with you and connect you to the assessment and uh, do a readout for it. And uh, um, you can always go to cpp.org. Uh, Charlie Papa Papa org. I forget what CPP stands for. They are the ones who own the uh, intellectual property around Myers Briggs. Again, it's only a framework. It's not something that you can. Um, once you label somebody as an ISTJ, you can say for certain how they're going to behave. We're too complex for that. The world around us is too complex. But there are some patterns, and those patterns are relatively consistent. And um, yours truly has found this. Uh, pattern this framework to be extremely helpful in understanding myself and how I relate to the world and understanding others such that we can actually create some really, really, really cool things. All right, enough of a lecture for today. I hope that was helpful and we'll see you next live stream. Take care.